don't want so if you don't want to be recorded, please um, keep in mind this. Uh, the other thing is you are now all muted. And uh, later in the discussion, if you will be uh, asking some questions, you would be um, uh, asked to raise hand or write down a comment uh, in the chat. And you will also give opportunity to uh, speak. Um so this is for uh this is for the technicality. So if everyone agree, I would like now officially to start with the project. So dear all, this is a seminar on connecting European pro uh, battery project. Is it uh, one of the series of events that we organize in collaboration with the battery community? and Aeronets project. As you may know, Aeronets are a European Commission project, uh, networks of funding organization that usually launch uh, transnational joint calls in different topics. Last year, we start uh, with the collaboration uh, on the, with the battery community to promote all battery related funded project um, under mRNIT scheme. mRNIT scheme supports advanced materials research and innovation. And today we will continue with this promotion and we will try to promote battery related project funded uh, under Aramin scheme. More about Aramin, uh, we'll tell you a coordinator of Aramin, Dina Carillo, a little bit later. Uh, just to uh, tell you that the aim of today's event is to build a cooperation among all of us. So the funding organization, the battery community, and you, the, the project um, coordinators and partners. And the uh, aim is to, to talk with you. Uh, we, we ask you to present shortly uh, the results of your uh, project if you have any problems any issues maybe we can discuss together and solve um, in a common way uh, your problems so it's a it's a place where we would like to support you in the communication among each other so i would like warmly welcome also our um, moderator for the expert uh, in the battery field marcel meus uh, who represent the battery community, mainly CSA Project Battery 2030 Plus, and Robert Domingo will later present you more on these uh, activities of batteries 2030 Plus. So welcome all of you, and let's start with knowing each other. First, uh, Aramin uh, Coordinator Dina Carillo will present what the network Aramin founds under their calls. Dina, the floor is your. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. So uh, I think you are already familiar with Aramin, but let's start. So we are, who are we, the Eremin Network? Uh, it's a Neronet uh, co-fund uh, uh, public, public partnership uh, on raw materials. So this means that the only eligible partners are research funding programs uh, from countries and regions in Europe and also outside Europe. We started in December, 2020, and our network will finish in uh, November, 2025. Um, see. So our main goal as a public-public partnership is uh, really to coordinate the different funding programs and uh, by doing that we support research innovation in Europe and also globally. So we also aim to support the raw materials uh, policies, European and also the strategic partnerships because we involve also countries that have established these partnerships with the European Union. 
And uh, of course, we want to support raw materials um, for a green and digital and towards a circular economy transition. So by coordinating the different funding programs, we implement joint transnational calls on needs-driven research, addressing specifically the construction, industrial, and metallic minerals. Uh, so uh, our clients, let's say, are universities, research institutes, small, medium, and large enterprises that apply for funding in a, a joint consortia. And by doing this, we try to reduce the fragmentation that exists at national, regional level in terms of research innovation funding. So the European Commission has supported three networks uh, of uh, Eremin uh, since 2011. And um, as a result of this support, uh, more than uh, 10 million euros, um, we have been complementing uh, the other different instruments that exist. Uh, for example, uh, Eremin uh, is supporting uh, projects, smaller projects with small number of partners and countries and also budget between 0.5, 1.5 million euros, and also low TRLs, so uh, between one and six, uh, more or less in average. And because of this, we complement not only the national and regional funding programs, but also Horizon Europe, and also EIT raw materials uh, calls, because EIT can only, only support projects from TRL 5 up to 7, and Eremin can support projects with low TRL. So we think that this instrument is really important, especially for newcomers in international cooperation, because we allow them to start building a small project before applying to larger projects in Horizon uh, Europe. So as you can see, uh, we have all these countries involved in our projects. We had also regions and countries that have associated to our calls. And as a result, um, there was an investment of 11.5 million from the commission in our three networks, but with the, the, the contribution of the national regional uh, funding and also the contribution from the companies participating with own uh, budget, we have reached 93 million euros of total costs of this, all these projects, 88 projects. So we published this, um, this paper, is open access paper, and uh, the, which summarizes the results, our activities, when we celebrated the 10th anniversary of Eremin. So as I said, Eremin wants to contribute for the raw materials policies. Uh, we started with the Eremin research agenda. It's already 10 years now. And this uh, agenda was a, a background document of the strategic implementation plan of the European Innovation Partnership on Raw Materials. That's why we asked all our projects to contribute for the objectives. Uh, of the Eremin Research Agenda and the SIP, as you can see here. But uh, along the years, we have also asked our projects to contribute for the other uh, raw materials policies. For example, the EU-Canada Strategic Partnership and the Action Plan on Critical Raw Materials. So our, all our joint calls were on needs-driven research and we have topics addressing primary resources from exploration, mining, refining, mineral processing, then also addressing secondary raw materials, design and substitution of critical raw materials, resource efficient production. So under a circular economy, as you can see here, and also we have, um, uh, let's say, cross-cutting topics on environmental assessment and social sustainability, as you can see. So our topics, the calls of our topics are really in line also with the um, Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, this more recent policy. So as a result of these eight joint calls that Eremin has implemented, 
we have supported a total of 88 projects in which we see that we have participation of 30% of enterprises in average. And for that reason, the total costs are 93 million and the 68 million euros of public funding invested in this project. Uh, in average, um, so 770,000 euros is the average funding per project. And in terms of, of topics, the projects, our projects can um, address uh, also uh, raw materials for batteries and also recycling of batteries. Um, and this is also interesting to see that from now on, you can have access to this uh, web-based knowledge platform, the Raw Materials Information System, and you can have a direct link for the Eremin dashboard, as you can see here. But you also can see that you have other topics on battery supply challenges, so it's very interesting to see. So our dashboard is an interactive map that I invite you to, to search for that allows you to know more about the projects that we have funded. We can see the countries involved, how many projects per country, and we can also see the, the number of projects uh, in each category of the Remain Research Agenda. So up to now, we have much more projects on uh, secondary sources, on recycling, um, than on primary, but also we have four projects on substitution of critical raw materials and others. In terms of mineral category, half of our projects, um, more than half, address ores and metals. But we also have 17% uh, addressing industrial minerals and also 12.5% uh, addressing construction materials. So this slide is really to show you that it was there was a change of trend so when we started in the first calls, we had a focus on primary resources supply. And then uh, in Eremin 2, with the circular economy package, uh, now we see a change in the trend. So now we have more projects on secondary resources supply. We also have a map of the keywords of all the projects that we have funded. So you see that the most addressed uh, keywords are, for example, rare earth, um, but also uh, recycling, end of life, and specifically for this workshop, it is relevant to see 12 projects supported with 8.5 million euros, it is funding, and also projects on lithium, 12 projects, 9.2 million euros. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I think I already said this. So you can find more information about this project on the YouTube channel of Eremin. So you see here uh, four projects which have a short video telling us about testimonials, the advantages of having a project and the benefits of having uh, a project and also tips. And, and uh, in addition, to this, we also have all the summaries in our website. These are the other projects that we will hear today. So not only addressing uh, raw materials for batteries, but also recycling of end of use batteries and also design of new batteries. So just for you to understand that we perform a monitoring of the projects that we have funded. So projects submit annual reports and we organize midterm and final seminars of these funded projects to promote the uh, exchange of um, information. Uh, in terms of synergies, um, we have a synergy with uh, another ARNET called MRNET on advanced materials, because the topic two of ARNET on product design and substitution of critical raw materials, we really need the contribution of the material science and engineering to uh, address this topic in ARNET and cover the whole innovation chain. So as I told you, our agenda is already uh, 10 years. Uh, so it's time to update the agenda. And now we are in this process of updating the strategic research innovation agenda to identify what are the new challenges and uh, the needs for research innovation for up to 2040. We are doing this process because the, the agenda is really a key requirement for the continuation of Eremin 3 through a proposed 
co-funded partnership on raw materials. So this is good news. So we expect to, to continue uh, for uh, seven, 10 years uh, to support uh, the raw materials policies and strategic partnerships. And we expect to implement annual co-funded calls um, to address low TRLs complementing a rise in Europe and EIT raw materials calls and address the whole innovation chain from exploration, mining, processing, recycling, and substitution of critical raw materials, including also other uh, cross-cutting topics. And because we believe that this scheme uh, provides more opportunities for all countries across Europe and regions, and also the, to facilitate the collaboration with countries outside Europe, as you have seen with Canada, with uh, Chile, Brazil, South Africa, Argentina, for example. So thank you very much. If you have any question, I'm available to, to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. So let's now, um, let's now have a word from uh, Robert Dominko, who represents today um, uh, Battery 2030 Plus project, uh, one of the partner in this workshop. So Robert Dominko will probably tell you uh, where the battery community is looking forward in next years. So when, where we can uh, work together in future. Okay, thank you, Dorothea, and uh, good afternoon to all of you, especially to community that is uh, not really every day connected with the uh, with the battery community. I quickly checked the list of attendees today, and although that I'm already in battery research uh, or for more than twenty five years, I'm not sure if I know anyone personally uh, today. So it's it's, it's a great pleasure that uh, we have this chance and we can actually present uh, Battery 2040 Plus initiative, uh, which is uh, coordinated uh, by Christina Enstrom from Uppsala University. Unfortunately, uh, we need to excuse her today uh, due to the uh, uh, some private uh, issues or some private events that she has and uh, she couldn't uh, Prevent, uh, present this uh, presentation, although she would like to really share with you uh, because uh, what what we did together and according to, uh, in in the frame of her coordination. Uh, so uh, probably all of you you heard about Battery Twenty Thirty Plus. Uh, uh, we are existing already for several years, and at the beginning. Uh, uh, we were creating, uh, created, or we were asked to to make a, a roadmap for for commission, roadmap uh, for basic research uh, activities. Uh, so to also to identify needs and gaps in the research society, which has to be founded. Uh, and based on this uh, initial roadmap, uh, later on we were awarded with uh, consortium supportive action which is uh, now actually uh, after five years, uh, we started with another three years uh, 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 term uh, um, with the Battery 2040 Plus uh, CSA uh, project. So besides uh, actually creating roadmaps and uh, out from roadmaps also uh, the possible calls uh, uh, for Battery Society and coordinating all these uh, activities, we are also heavily working on uh, curricula, uh, since we know that uh, battery European industry is actually transforming. Uh, green energy deal uh, requires uh, a lot of more uh, applications which are electricity driven and batteries are playing a key role there. So Europe is uh, actually building their own industry and uh, we need to actually find or we need to uh, educate uh, people with a proper education and that actually goes not, not only during uh, for the manufacturing and using batteries but it goes uh, along the whole uh, value chain so also the, the value chain that uh, is covered by aramine uh, consortium 
And besides that, uh, we we are working also on communication and engagement. And uh, what is also important, we try to harmonize uh, better research in Europe by uh, standardization and uh, by guide guidelines, how to actually uh, unify all the battery activities so we can move faster. So far uh, within the uh, project uh, proposal, uh, project calls uh, that were released uh, in last few years, uh, we have found it uh, several calls. Some of them, uh, this is the first group, uh, are almost finished or maybe some of them, they are even uh, really ended. Uh, but uh, some of them are uh, ongoing or they will start very soon. And among those calls, there are also several projects on uh, bed, uh, on recycling and also on manufacturing. Uh, our vision is, um, as we, if we can say that, uh, to reinvent the way we make the ultra high performance batteries in the future. So what does it mean? So uh, we know that uh, battery research uh, is relatively slow and uh, there are some methodologies which uh, are known already today and can be used, can be implemented into this research and uh, this battery research uh, can be accelerated. And that can provide to the Europe uh, a destructive uh, battery technologies which can give a competitive uh, advantage, uh, not only in the production, not only in the material discovery, but uh, uh, across the full value chain. So from materials, uh, from, uh, from elements uh, to, to, to recycling uh, for the production steps. And uh, that can provide then a Europe long-term leadership in both existing markets, uh, which are important for Europe, road transport and stationary storage, and also possible future emerging applications, since we know that batteries are penetrating in different applications, uh, just if I name some of them, uh, Internet of Things, robotics, uh, uh, medicine, and so on. Uh, as I, as I showed, there are already a number of EU projects uh, implemented uh, based on the roadmap that we prepared to the beginning. And this road, roadmap is actually is not something that we wrote and we forgot about it, but we are actually uh, completing or we are uh, developing this roadmap year by year uh, by, by new, uh, uh, and this is based on uh, new results that we obtain, new uh, the project results, uh, new discoveries, not only in Europe, but also worldwide. And based on that, uh, we mitigate our uh, research plans, uh, mid-term, uh, long-term research plans, and we can suggest uh, research and innovation actions for uh, new EU calls which are then uh, together with battery, with BEPA, with Batteries uh, Partnership, uh, published on the as, uh, op open tenders uh, for uh, uh, Battery Society or for Research Society in Europe. Uh, yeah, you can, you can actually check uh, last year update uh, of the long-term roadmap uh, that was, uh, that is, uh, accessible, uh, pub public accessible on the, this web page. And uh, you can see Christina, how she is proud of that uh, product since uh, really it creates a disruptive approach uh, in Europe and also enables European industry to catch up uh, uh, competitors from the East and also from, from the West part of the uh, uh, world. Uh, so our research areas can be divided in basically into three layers. Uh, the upper layer shows uh, accelerated uh, platforms uh, for uh, materials uh, design and also battery interface genome. So to, to understand battery interface design. So all these are based on uh, on uh, artificial or uh, accelerated uh, approaches uh, and uh, which are based on the data and which are supported then by ontology. Uh, and uh, this actually leads us uh, to discovery of new materials, also self-healing materials. 
And uh, in the second uh, actually level, we have uh, this so-called so uh, smart functionalities within the batteries, uh, so-called self-healing and sensing, which can create together uh, opportunity to improve uh, safety, to improve uh, cycle life, to improve uh, durability, and also uh, to improve uh, in part uh, need for, for minerals since uh, we can prolong uh, the lifetime of the cells. And uh, all these approaches, both layers are always developed with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, we, we have in my, our mind that uh, we need to have approaches which are manufacturable and which are recyclable. So uh, these are also our cross-cutting research areas. Uh, as, as, said, uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning, uh, we have published several projects uh, on all three layers. And uh, here are the latest results from uh, 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 for for the projects the, which are coordinated uh, by uh, Eliana Quartone from University of Pavia, Uwe Posset from Fraunhofer, and uh, Susalait uh, Bandu Bandu oh, from uh, Norwegian Technical University. Uh, so those three projects uh, were just recently uh, accepted uh, for, and they will start uh, with uh, with the work, uh, and they will contribute to the future recycling process, which can be, uh, as you are aware, a direct recycling process in battery, or maybe a recycling process uh, uh, to components, or if it's if it's if that is not possible, then uh, this classical recycling processes that we know up to elements and uh, using different procedures. Uh, Another important part of Battery 2030 Plus is standardization of protocols for experimental data and for modeling methods. So uh, this is this first layer which uh, where we have materials acceleration platform and batteries interface genome. And uh, most of that is developed in big map project, but not all of this, uh, also other projects are contributing to that. And the idea is uh, to have a unified platforms in Europe where uh, we can have fair data and uh, we can obtain that by fostering collaboration and innovation in the field of battery uh, research and development. And to do that, we need to create a more connected European battery community. So exchange, uh, and for this, uh, we need exchange of ideas, information, data, data, in uh, to, to be able to do this automated data analysis, artificial intelligence driven approaches, and uh, with that also accelerated materials discovery. Uh, I already mentioned ontology. So this is a, a large part of a big map project and uh, it, it is based on the standardization and it creates protocols for uh, data and metadata. And uh, then this is actually disseminated for the workshops uh, and for different research areas. So the objective of this uh, part is uh, to, to get the best practice guidelines uh, and put these guidelines then into the practice. And uh, somehow uh, within the Battery 2030 Plus projects, uh, we are trying to unify uh, this uh, approach uh, that we have a uh, unique approach and also the projects which are not under a better 2030 plus umbrella, uh, they are actually invited to join us. Uh, most of the work uh, within better 2030 plus is done by uh, institutions uh, actually where all logotypes are shown here. Uh, the, as I said, the uh, work is, uh, the, this consortium supportive action is supported by Uppsala University and all others. Uh, we are contributing uh, through the uh, contribution of through the, through the grant that the uh, commission will actually give us, but also uh, more than above that grant, because this is, uh, this, there is a really a lot of work uh, in this coordination, and, uh, but we are, we are really happy to do that. So just to briefly show you that uh, most of the Europe is uh, actually engaged in this, uh, in projects, but uh, also in the CSA. Uh, uh, we are 
trying to also to bring more uh, project partners from the Eastern Europe, which is a little bit uh, not well covered right now. Uh, but uh, this is also an uh, ongoing process which needs time to to actually encourage also groups from Eastern Europe to collaborate and to, to contribute into this uh, area. Uh, so more about uh, where from our coordinators. So you can see uh, they are from different parts of the world, uh, from Scandinavia, Germany, France, Spain. Uh, so many, many different ideas are joined together with also with uh, partners that are coming from several different countries. And uh, right now in the pipeline for the next uh, for the next uh, year, there are for, for this year there are uh, three projects. Uh, uh, two of them uh, we have a very short, uh, very narrow deadline of uh, mid of April. Uh, one on uh, post uh, lithium technologies, so called TRL. Uh, uh, generation five technologies. Uh, this one is a little bit later in uh, in uh, September, and hopefully uh, we will be able to see some of your applications also uh, within these calls. Uh, so I already mentioned this uh, large scale research initiative. I see Dorothea is signalizing me that I need to speed up. Uh, so uh, I also mentioned that uh, we have a roadmap. And I also mentioned at the beginning curricula. Uh, and through this curricula, we are also engaging uh, young scientists uh, to contribute to the roadmap, to con contribute uh, uh, to, to actually express their needs uh, and to show what, uh, what should be done in the future. But of course, we will need also many young scientists uh, in the future who will be uh, uh, teachers uh, for the next generation of uh, battery experts, either those who will be employed in the industry or those who will be uh, in R&D departments. Uh, we are organizing uh, different workshops. Uh, please uh, check uh, regularly web page, Battery 2030 Plus. As Dorothea mentioned, uh, last year we also held uh, a Maranet workshop. Uh, there were actually two workshops uh, for the, the generation of projects uh, financed by Aranet. And I would like to invite you also that uh, you check Battery 2030 Plus uh, web page uh, where you can find excellent seminars. Uh, all these seminars are recorded and uh, you, can, you can actually watch uh, recordings on YouTube channels. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Aramin Con uh, Consortia and also Dorothea for this invitation. And uh, if there is any question, uh, please address me, or it's even better, Christina Enstrom. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Robert. So we all hear you that you really connecting all the battery project to connecting the knowledge in battery fields. You show us the place where our participants can find new uh, knowledge, uh, new partners, new ideas. Thank you for this, Robert. And now it's time that we show what we already found under the Aramin scheme. So the next part of our uh, event today will be a project uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we will have a group of project and uh, re with really short presentation what you are doing. And then Marcel Meus as a moderator of this event will try to find the, the, the issues that are common to all of you or maybe um, you can ask uh, him or Robert a question uh, and uh, they will help you to, to, to um, um, build a project in the, the best possible way. So Marcel, means welcome. Uh, and the floor is yours. And uh, I will invite the Victoria Flexer, uh, Lee Water project to present first. Yes. Um, hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your 
presentation. Everything is okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, this is a project that was part of the Aramin mean, two call. Um, and this was a relatively small consortium. It was a consortium of three parties, um, uh, IVL in Sweden, uh, Hent University in Belgium, and the National University of Jujuy in Argentina. Um, I am Victoria Flexer, and I was the PI and the coordinator of uh, this project. Um, the project finished already a while ago. It started in April 2018, and it, it was extended it, it lasted for 36 months. So um, everybody knows already here, lithium is a fundamental raw material for the energy transition. And this project was addressing um, mining, particularly from um, salars or salt lakes, such as the ones we find in South America, the, the US and China. But the technology we were trying to develop was also aimed at potentially be applied uh, to um, either geothermal sources or uh, produce waters in the oil industry that also contain lithium. Um, so as I said, uh, uh, Europe does not have this concentrated uh, natural brines, but you have particularly interesting geothermal deposits and, and, and also uh, um, oil fields. Uh, the current technology for lithium mining from brines is what I'm showing here in this picture, and it's mostly uh, based on uh, water evaporation from the natural brines. And this has many, many um, issues. Uh, the most important regarding Europe is that uh, you cannot actually apply this technology to the European brines because you require a minimum concentration and also you do require extreme aridity and high solar irradiation. Um, therefore, you can only apply this technology in the middle of the desert where a few of these uh, natural concentrated lithium rich brines are used. Um, therefore, a lot of uh, people in the world have started working in what is called direct lithium extraction technologies or DLE technologies. And there are uh, a wide array of such technologies. Um, most of these, they are quite energy intensive as compared to natural evaporation. And most of these, they do uh, proposed to uh, process the brine and after uh, brine processing to produce pure lithium salts, the brine will very likely be re-injected. And this is something uh, which is a still quite an open issue. It might be relatively straightforward um, in the oil field. Uh, it's, it's not so clear if this could be possible, particularly in the, in the concentrated um, natural brines in, in, Latin, in South America, but also some geothermal fields are at, 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 at a big question here. So our idea was a little bit different. We said, what if is not only we do produce the lithium salts, which are the valuable raw material, the most valuable raw material, but we also aim at producing other, other products um, from these brines, because these brines, they actually do contain much more of other product, of other components, such as magnesium, sodium, borates, and the like. And if we manage to do this, we could eventually uh, end up with some sort of water of reduced salinity or fresh water, because we have removed most of the salts. Um, so our system is based on uh, electrodialysis concepts and what we pro propose to do is to uh, slowly deplete the different salts and the first thing we do is um, we produce uh, alkali and we crystallize the multivalent species and then we deplete the uh, sodium as sodium bicarbonate also absorbing CO2 so sequestering CO2 from, from the air and eventually producing lithium carbonate also in an electrochemical way. We did most of our experiments in the lab with native brines and uh, we managed to show that we could fully deplete the magnesium and the calcium. Uh, we could also decrease most of the sodium as shown by the decrease in conductivity and density of our solutions. Um, and we could produce our final product on different solutions with, with very high purity. We could finally show that uh, there was low salinity water produced uh, out of this technology. So um, our project ended at TRL level uh, five. We managed to test the technology on, on, on several different native South American brines without any pretreatment. 
We produce high purity products in the lab and particularly lithium carbonate. We arrive at 99.8% purity. We did produce the uh, low salinity water and we managed to build a pilot um, system with a processing capacity for 300 liters uh, of brine per day. Uh, this was with further uh, input from, from industry at a little bit later stage. Um, so lots of technologies propose this and, and their, their input in terms of energy is pretty low. Um, but actually we do think that uh, technologies should be pros, uh, should be analyzed in this way. We should actually consider and calculate not only the energy input in the key DLE technology, but also the energy chemicals and freshwater input of, of both the pre-processing and post-processing, not just the key step. And I, would I say this because our technology is a little bit energy intensive, but if you compare with other technologies such as uh, ion exchange resins, when you take into account that you require fresh water in dilution and you end up in the ponds because your lithium chloride is not concentrated enough um, and you might need brine heating, then our technology becomes quite competitive. And um, at the end, I would like to invite you all we are organizing um, a conference in July this year in Argentina. Uh, some of the partners from, from the era I'm into uh, project are participating. And then we are also joining forces with uh, colleagues in France and in Sweden. And we are discussing uh, all lithium related topics from um, mining to batteries. Um, so please uh, write my emails down if you're interested or those of uh, my fellow colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Victoria. Um, Victoria. Thank you. Um, I'm now looking for Alexandre Lima or someone who could, who, could pro, who could present the lights project because I don't find the name on my list. Is it someone who will present lights? If not, um, let's um, go to the Sims Deep project. Uh, Ula, you can you can present the project Sims Deep. Yes, thank you. Um, So uh, in the SIMSTIP project, we are developing uh, geophysical deep exploration methods. Uh, as we know, uh, the demand for uh, raw materials is, is drastically increasing, but at the same, same time, surface deposits are getting more and more scarce. So we need to develop a lot of uh, new effective ways to find uh, deeper mineralization. Um, here is the project control zoom for the seams deep. So there are uh, eight partners from uh, four countries, both from uh, academy and, and industry. And the project is, is coordinated by the uh, Geological Survey of Finland, uh, who I am representing. Uh, it's a three-year project, and it will end uh, next year. So we are a bit past the halfway uh, of the project, project now. Uh, below, you can see a nice photo uh, from the fieldwork related to this project, which, which was completed last year, and the results from, from this, this fieldwork uh, from the basis for, for later achievements uh, to be done in the project. So we are... Uh, developing seismic and, and electromagnetic uh, geophysical methods in this project for uh, improved uh, uh, deep bedrock truck imaging. And uh, from the outset, these methods are combined, starting from survey design and, and ending in 
joint imaging of, of the bed rock. So we are create, uh, developing uh, workflow for optimal in geophysical imaging and improved geomodels for, for deep mineral uh, deposits. An important uh, aspect of this project is also this geomodeling. So we, in the end, take all the geophysical re results uh, uh, we get and, and also advanced creation of, of improved uh, geomodels. And uh, the geological test site in this project is in, in Finland. Geologically, the so-called uh, Koilisma layered igneous complex, um, which is, and this type of ge geological environment is, is known to be prospective for uh, various commodities, including uh, many or battery minerals and, and critical uh, minerals. So before the CMC project, uh, Geological Survey of Finland uh, drilled a 1.7 kilometer long uh, drill hole at the site. And the results from this, this drill hole are, are used for the benefit of this project also. For example, we get petrophysical data. And uh, so last year we, we completed the data acquisition phase in, in August, September. On the map, you can see the acquired seismic and, and electromagnetic geophysical data distribution. And, and currently then uh, project partners are hard working uh, to process this, all this data. And also we have some first first results emerging. Here are an example for a, a seismic reflection image from the test site. And uh, moving further, we are then uh, will be emphasizing the joint aspect. So combining the seismic and electromagnetic data to get the best possible. Uh, imaging result results. And uh, so before this data acquisition, we constructed the initial geo model, which you can see here. And, and based on then the results from the measurements, we will improve the geo model and, and the workflow of how, how to how these uh, geo models are, are, are constructed. So with that, uh, we hope that we can uh, develop cost-effective uh, multi-method multi geophysical methods for deep exploration. And then hopefully this will reduce overall exploration cost, for example, by reducing the needed uh, uh, deep drill holes and also to improve the success rate, exploration success rate for finding the deep deposits. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we have two boss project. I believe Andrew will be a presenter. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me share the screen. Uh, we see, but it's not in presentation mode. No. Yeah, now it is. Thank you. Okay. We can hear so, you and thank see. You. Thank you for the introduction. So this is Andreu Cabot from the Catalonia Institute for Energy Research in Barcelona. I'm the coordinator of this. Let me put down this, of oh, this uh, two boss project towards sustainable batteries based on silicon, sulfur, and biomass derived um, carbon. Here, the main, well, this is an era mine three project, three, 36 month duration, and we are more or less in the middle of the project. So I will show you a little what uh, we want to do during this project and also a little what we've been doing 
during this first half. So the main goal of uh, the TUVOS project is to develop a high energy density uh, and durable battery technology. This is based on a sulfur cathode and a silicon anode. Both silicon and uh, sulfur provide a higher energy density. As you can see here, this should be a safe uh, energy technology. We are not using uh, lithium metal at the anode, but we replace this by uh, silicon. And also we want to reduce the use of critical raw materials here. So we will minimize the, um, the metals used as a catalyst in the cathode site and uh, in also in the anode uh, site to grow these uh, silicon nanowires. Mm -hmm. And this technology has some um, uh, challenges like uh, sulfur, for example, and lithium sulfide both have very low electrical conductivity. So we have to do a proper composite with carbon. Also during cycling in this type of batteries, sulfur is typically lost in the form of lithium polysulfide. So we need to block this, um, this dissolution of the lithium polysulfides. At the anode side, we have this large volume expansion of the silicon that we need somehow to prevent. That's why we are using um, uh, silicon and wires and also with a composite with uh, carbon. Okay, more particular, the specific objective or the project and also the related tasks that we are developing is to produce these uh, nitrogen dope carbon supports, both for the growth of the silicon and also as a host for the sulfur. And we produce this carbon from organic waste. We produce from this carbon from the organic waste, the lithium sulfur carbon composites for the cathode and the silicon carbon composites for the anode. We are also developing uh, functional um, membranes to block this lithium polysulfide diffusion. We will assemble, we, are, we have started to do so, full uh, silicon sulfur uh, cells, uh, first at the coin cell level and later at the pouch uh, with pouch type uh, cells. And in parallel to this technological development, we are um, we are uh, finding or we are developing the strategies already to recycle this silicon, the lithium and the metals that we are going to introduce there as catalyst. And in parallel also, we are assessing the cost, environmental and social life cycle impact and the health and safety issues of this related technology. And with this parallel development, we get feedback so we can um, modify the process and the elements that we are introducing there. And of course, last objective is to efficiency, efficiently disseminate and exploit the project uh, results. Uh, some uh, results obtained so far. Here I'm showing you some composites that we obtain uh, with the silicon and wires and the carbon obtained from biomass. We also use this carbon from biomass to produce, as I say, the sulfur uh, carbon cathode. We have been assembling both the anode and cathode that we produce separated into full cell batteries. This is some um, uh, some charging discharge gene curves of the full cell batteries. We are obtaining already good uh, specific capacities and decent uh, stabilities, which is which is so far the main limitation. Also, to find the electrolyte that that combines well with the two electrodes. We have published already these initial results in this uh, publication recently. And in parallel to these uh, technological developments, as I was saying, you we are uh, studying the cost and impact, environmental impact, safety, uh, and safety of the processes and of the elements we are using. And we will extend this from the lab scale that we are uh, doing this now to the industrial uh, scale. We will also compare the impact of this uh, technology with the um, technology that is now on the market. And we are um, uh, building an inventory data that we will make it available for other projects or other groups to, to use it with data from this technology. Um, yeah, also in parallel, we are studying the recycling of the metals and at the same time contacting with different 
companies that can provide us with the precursor from these uh, from these uh, the elements that we are using in this technology like for example the winery Jopart here in Spain that provides us with organic ways that we use to produce the carbon some um, silicon we are in contact with some solar panel manufacturers so we can use the silicon from old uh, silicon solar cells graphite and lithium can come from old lithium ion batteries metals from different uh, processes and sulfur could come from the oil refinery for example process and yes, finally, this is an important slide. This is the uh, Tubos team. Uh, uh, there are four partners in this Tubos project. IREC here in Barcelona, in Spain, the company Cleopa from Germany, the Politecnico di Torino in Italy, and uh, CA Grenoble in France. Oh, this is the people. We have this webpage, the tubos.eu. EU, where you can find much more information about the project that from uh, that uh, what I have explained you so far. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. Oh, we are quite active here, posting um, uh, different newsletters and uh, press release, some other information that you can find there. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you all. Before I um, leave uh, the, the word to Marcel, just to mention that all your participants, you can also um, write down the, uh, the, the questions and, and uh, uh, raise hands and we will involve you into the discussion. So Marcel, Dorothea. probably you have, yes? Sorry, yes. Ale Alexandre Limais. Also with uh -huh. us. Okay, Alexandre Lima. Uh, as I have notes, you could be a presenter of Lights Project. Is that so, Alexandre? Alexandre? Maybe he doesn't hear us. Okay, Marcel, the yeah. floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothea. Um, yeah, we tried to cluster the 12 projects in this afternoon in three blocks. And this block is uh, centered, focused on lithium, uh, the lithium extraction and the lithium exploration and the lithium utilization. Thank you very much for the three presentations. And I would like to to discuss with you a little bit first the TRL levels that you are obtaining or focusing to obtain. And if I understand well, um, with lit simplest water, we are at TRL 5. Um, but for seams deep and to bus, if I'm not wrong, the TRL levels are still quite low. Uh, do you agree with that? With Victoria, you are at five, no? Yes, our project is at TRL level five. And uh, I mean, the project is already finished. It finished in early 2021. Um, we are continuing working on these ideas. Uh, however, so far we have been unsuccessful in in gathering uh, enough funding to try to take the project any further. And what kind of uh, funding uh, sources do you aim at? <clears throat> well, both public body funding and also industry funding. Um, uh, we are not restricted regarding this. Um, our, our tests in the lab, as I said, they are working very, very nicely. Uh, we have found that, so I presented my project in three different stages, so three different uh, processes within the main uh, processing strategy. 
One of such stages is high energy intensive. And we have, uh, we have since the end of the project developed like an alternative idea to bypass that, um, that high energy intensive uh, uh, step. Um, but uh, brine processing requires processing of, of, of millions of liters. So even the 300 liters per day pilot that I showed in my slide, it's a, a very, very small pilot. Mm -hmm. When we talk about brines, regardless of the source of the brine, so whether it's a geothermal brine or a oil field brine, we need to think that anything that we do, it needs to be relatively simple because you cannot implement complicated technologies if you're aiming at something close to 25 millions of brine uh, 25 million liter of brine to be processed every day. So you need to think um, simple. And also any piloting that you do is going to be at the very, very late, less uh, 100 liters. Otherwise it can't really be called a pilot because you really need to upscale. So that's, but, that's basically where we are. But I don't remember the uh, exact names, but I believe there are startups, no? already involved in direct lithium extraction. Is there no possibility for you to collaborate with industrial partners? Oh, yeah, 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 indeed there is. And um, so myself, also, so my, my research group in Argentina is associated with, with two SME that are interested in, in our technology. Most of uh, the startups that you mentioned that you mentioned that they they have fancy names, they actually they they have their own technologies. So most of them, what they are trying to do is to gather funding to actually implement their technologies. They are not strictly interesting in 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 gathering more alternatives and have a portfolio of technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have uh, some small projects with industry. But uh, they are they are not the large funding that we require at such a stage to to aim at at saying we have reached higher TRL level. So we are still advancing in the lab, and we are advancing with many technical issues. Um, we are advancing on the small pilot that we have, so on the three hundred liter pilot. It's not that the project is 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 uh, 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 it's over. We we do still work on these ideas. Thank you. And for seems deep, um, I believe there you are still at very low TRL level. Is it not? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the estimated start TRL for this this project was three, and and we aim at five or six as the end. So so the main. Uh, technological development is, is related to this application and integration of these two geophysical methods, so uh, seismic and electromagnetic methods, which have been used a lot by themselves, but uh, this combined joint use is not and so very, uh, yes. Is, is there interest from industrial partners in your technology? Yes, so yes, there is. So we have three three SMEs working in this 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 uh, project, and there are exploration company and and company developing geophysical instruments, and they will will benefit from the results. Now, maybe a question to you both: um, Do we uh, do we have an idea? about lithium resources in Europe, which are available. If you look at the battery industry, we will need worldwide huge quantities of lithium. Um, for instance, looking at the battery market by 2013, 2013 we are looking at a, a market of roughly 3,600 uh, gigawatt hours. Now, if you translate that in lithium, 3,600 gigawatt hours, that is roughly uh, 350,000 tons of lithium. 
Now, um, there is a, a series that's worldwide, that's, that's not, that's that's not worldwide. Europe. Uh, some sources mm -hmm. mention availability of 140,000 tons of lithium. There is a shortfall, a big shortfall of lithium of about 200,000 tons worldwide. Do we have an idea uh, what, and, and that is where, where because that is the reason why uh, lithium recycling is uh, badly needed. Do we have an idea about lithium reserves in Europe? Victoria, do you know that? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, there are very interesting uh, geothermal deposits um, uh, in the border between uh, uh, France and Germany, uh, all along the Rhine uh, region. Um, and there are also some interesting geothermal deposits uh, in Italy, around the Dolomites. Then there are uh, two hard rock deposits uh, in Portugal, and the other one, I think it's in Norway. If it's not in Norway, somewhere in, 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 in Scandinavia. And then there, so the, the hard rock deposits, if I'm not mistaken, they are either already being exploited or close to uh, start being exploited. And then there are some more uh, adventurous projects, I would say, because they are um, uh, clays um, around, um, um uh in uh i think uh, in serbia they have interesting clay projects and something i heard uh, in the tech republic but that's that's uh, a little bit uh behind however all these deposits are really really uh small in their uh in their lithium so they it's lithium is diluted and and the reserves are are, are quite a small as compared to uh, the, 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 the lithium amounts you could recover either in the lithium triangle in South America or the lithium you could recover from hard rock in Australia or China, for instance. So I think uh, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm not a, an, a, a resource anal analyst, but I think Europe will still need to depend on uh, lithium from outside of Europe. So it's important to have some European lithium out of geopolitics. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, uh, reading the chat. So Eramed, for instance, a French company is about to start exploitation here in Argentina. That brings us to the utilization of lithium and to tubos. Uh, it's really a nice system that you are developing there um, at tubos. Uh, this belongs to generation five in the battery roadmap. Um, uh, problems will be probably the cycle life of the system because of the polysulfide migration. Um, based on the first results that you have, what would be your cycle life that you think will be possible with the system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so main problem actually is to combine the the, two, the silicon anode with the sulfur cathode because, cathode because the electrolyte that works well with the silicon doesn't work so well for the sulfur and the electrolyte that works well for the sulfur doesn't work so well for the silicon. So now, now we can cycle the battery maybe around 100, 200 cycles and we are losing already uh, we go down to 60% of the initial capacity, something like this. So still uh, the performance is, uh, is poor. And this, uh, I, I, I wouldn't associate to one, to the cathode or the anode, but to this electrolyte. We need to find a better electrolyte that allows us uh, to combine these two electrodes or some coating also is the other strategy, some coating of the, maybe the silicon anode that uh, stabilizes the silicon and the electrolyte that works well for the sulfur, let's say. So, so electrolyte, the combination is the key part now at this point of the project. Yeah. You don't see the swelling of the lit of the silicon as a problem with, in your with your composite, no? Yeah, yeah de definitely. This is uh, this is uh, the these volume changes of the silicon are uh, always. Uh, 
uh, a problem, but I wouldn't say this is the limitation that we have now. Uh, because in this composite, we have the nanowires, which are quite thin, and we are adding, I think, 50% of silicon in this composite. So in these conditions, it's not, uh, I would say, it's not so bad, the performance of the anode itself when we, when we do half cells. But when we combine again, when we put in the wrong or in the not so good electrolyte, then the performance is not uh, that uh, excellent. Coming back to the TRL level, that is quite low. That is below three still. The combination of this anode and cathode is at a low TRL uh, level, you are right. Yeah. And the different components, uh, here we are also in parallel developing silicon anodes that could be used with other type of cathodes. And we are also working on improving sulfur cathodes that could be used, for example, with a lithium uh, anode, metal lithium. Safety will be not so good. But the, in these different uh, independent components, TRL is, is um, it's much higher. We are just trying to remove uh, metals from there, actually, uh, to make it, uh, to remove the use of critical raw material, let's say that uh, in some cases are used. But yes, the combination of the two, of the, comp the complete system, is a still at a relatively low TRL level. The goal of the project is to reach five, but we'll see. And look, looking at the energy density, you fo your focus at, uh, is at 400 watt hour per kilogram. In your first results, what do you obtain? Um, so, but, yeah. Uh, so this is the capacity we are at uh, level, on cell level. Yeah, we are at 400 milliamp hour gram, uh, but uh, during the first cycles, 450 actually. But this is this at the electrode level. This at the it. cell, we need to go. We need to go to the pouch cell to really get a good estimate at cell level, taking into account all the components. And Good. you don't, are, you don't, you, you, you are not at cell level yet. You we, still we, are, at, mm -hmm. we are at coin cell level, but coin here cell. the encapsulation, you know, it uh, is most of the mass of the battery. We cannot calculate well here. We need to move to the pouch uh, soon. Okay. Looking at, the, looking at our time schedule. Yeah, sorry, Alexander, yeah. 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 I think that we have a time for the question of Alexandra Caroline. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, sorry for being here only at this hour. Uh, I missed the beginning, uh, but I congratulate Dina Carrillo for the initiative and all the partners that are in this uh, meeting. So I am at the project uh, that to uh, win the f funds from uh, uh, Arise uh, Europa uh, that is called Re Re Relief um, Recycling Lithium and uh, Farther from uh, Batteries. And uh, uh, we are uh, partners uh, because, as the as Victoria Flexer uh, said, uh, I am the Portuguese that uh, uh, explode feldspar with, with the lepidolite and uh, some uh, petalite uh, from raw materials uh, after uh, a lot of years. Uh, my family stays in this business for more than 100 years in Portugal only, and is in this uh, uh, low density area of Portugal near the border with Spain. Um, and uh, we are uh, available for uh, new projects uh, linked the, with the construction of the uh, cathodes uh, in order to uh, reinforce uh, our felt spar that is only uh, goes for the ceramic or glass industry. Uh, so uh, we are open. Uh, I am the owner, so uh, I invite uh, to try uh, to get some funds together, and um, uh, I will uh, see you with very uh, pleasure. Uh, 
all the partners uh, being together in Eramin 3. Uh, we tried already uh, some funds uh, linked with the University of Oporto uh, with the engineer Cristina Villa, but uh, for the moment we didn't uh, reach the point uh, we need. Uh, relief, it's a uh, a little bit higher. Uh, we are in the um, almost six seven, uh, but uh, we we want to go in a consortium uh, stronger than this. Eight, eight, almost eight nine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I leave my my con connections in the chat. Very good. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions to the speakers? Dina has a... I have, may I just say that I wrote uh, on the chat that EIT raw materials, they have an open call until the end of January that the project VTRL 6 now they can apply for funding to go up to TRL A, but you need to read all the guidelines and everything. But just for you to to know that. All right. Okay. Thank you. So I assume we could have a short break and then continue with presentation. I ask you to be back at fourteen fifty-five. No, uh, at let's say at uh, three o'clock um, to to start sharply at three with next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So welcome back. Just before we um, continue, I saw that Alexandre Lima is uh, on the list again. Alexandre, would you like to present the project light? Maybe to put you on the agenda. Okay. Otherwise, I. Uh, I no, no, yeah? no. Uh, yeah, just to comment uh -huh. that uh, uh -huh. the team from Lights are here. Uh, we had a problem when you call us that the the web here, the internet is uh, facing some problems. But anyway, we would like to present, but it's only three slides, but can be in the end of this session or you want. Okay, that, okay. okay it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's continue. So we have a project next leap now on our list and Guzu Ye is welcome uh, here to present the project. I already see him. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I sh share the screen or? Yeah, if, yes, if, if possible. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Can you do it in okay. a presentation mode? Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, yeah. Now you have a full screen. Yes. I hope. I hope. Uh, Okay, I, I will go, we have only three, five minutes, minutes so I will go straight <laughs> uh, to, the, uh, to the project uh, where we are uh, next deep. Uh, we, are, we have uh, partners from Sweden, Finland, and uh, France, CA, and also we have uh, a Porto from Portugal uh, for characterization. We have uh, uh, university uh, in uh, from Italy uh, for sustainability uh, uh, analysis, and then we have in Sweden we have um, a, a supplier uh, SME and uh, and uh, quite a big actually recycler of uh, material, Stena, uh, which is the biggest one in uh, Scandinavia, and uh, we have Akuset, which is the Finnish. Uh, uh, company uh, focus on uh, lithium ion battery recycling. And then we have uh, Buriton, which is uh, the biggest, um, uh, one of the biggest uh, copper producers in Europe. And of course we have GDK uh, who is doing, uh, you know, uh, mineral processing. So, uh, and at the uh, uh, Swedium, we are focused on high temperature processes for, for the recovery of the, uh, of uh, cathode materials and CEA and uh, extractive, they are extractive is a, is a SME um, startup company uh, specialized in hydrometallurgy. So CEA and extractive they are focused on hydrometallurgy. So what do we do in this project? Uh, we focus on this area, which. Uh, when we start the project, uh, people have not touched so much. So it's kind of, this project is a, a recycling project. So the area of people, I mean, most people done a lot of, um, very much on cobalt, nickel, all this value added, value added metal uh, recovery. So what we focus here is we try to uh, uh, focus on uh, electrolyte, we focus on uh, uh, graphite, we focus on lithium, uh, and also we focus on um, uh, safety. Uh, what kinds of hazardous gases you can get uh, during a processing of the spent lithium ion battery. So I go straight to the uh, to the results because our project and. Uh, 
uh, last year, uh, so we actually done most of the things. Uh, only, uh, as I mentioned, um, for the recovery of, uh, of graphite, we done pilot quite high TIA level at the GDK. Uh, and we we try to, first we, we, we have uh, some more uh, pyrolysis, uh, some more treatments of the blood mass, and then we uh, go for flotation. And then we try to uh, separate graphite from the other uh, materials. Uh, well, this part was not fully successful, and it's mainly we we done uh, Porto University done quite good work, and uh, uh, on 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 uh, characterization we found that even uh, you uh, with thermal treatments you really uh, don't still there are some binders. Uh, which is um, still stable and you don't uh, really liberate all the uh, graphite particles. Uh, one of these uh, most successful uh, uh, achievements is the, the lithium recovery. We are using thermal high temperature processes. So we, we basically evaporate uh, lithium uh, and correct them in the kinds of a uh, Feeder or, or condenser area where you can find uh, most of the lithium uh, can be uh, picked up uh, or could be correct uh, in this part. And actually, in another project, we have to do this in a big, big pilot scale uh, one ton per hour, something like that. I will, if you have a question, you can ask that later on. Uh, so, that part, the other part, as I say, we will also work on electrolyte uh, recovery. <coughs> Uh, and and we have uh, built kinds of a uh, simulator when you shred a uh, uh, lithium ion battery, and then we understand what kinds of hazardous gases you can get, and we also uh, built uh, this setup so we can correct electrolyte. Uh, and here you can see some equipment we are connected to this simulator. Uh, is a mass spectrometer, so we can see all these hazardous gases uh, that can be formed and find quite some hazardous gases actually from, from this uh, 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 simulator. Uh, when you, when you, you know, uh, abuse the uh, battery, then you can find a lot of hazardous gases uh, coming out. Uh, I don't show any figures here, but uh, I think if you're interested, I can show you uh, all these kinds of things, what kinds of gases you can you can get from uh, from that. Because you have fluoride, you have a lot of hydrocarbon. So of course you are you, you are getting a lot of uh, uh, hazardous gases. And that's, I think is quite important when you are working on uh, this kinds of battery. Uh, and then for the uh, hydrometallurgy, uh, yeah, we, uh, they are, we develop a different uh, um, uh, recipes, uh, which I'm not going to, to into detail. Uh, basically, uh, I think there are many other uh, uh, hydrometallurgical based, uh, based um, uh, methods as well. So there are always uh, advantages and disadvantages, and it's always uh, you know, when you optimize, you have to find uh, which elements you should pick up first, uh, and you have to look at the overall uh, E uh, in the end. So I'm not going into detail on that. Uh, so anyway, we uh, got uh, most of the results from each part. Uh, some of them are really, really uh, exciting, quite uh, uh, new. Uh, I, again, I will mention that the lithium high, high temperature uh, uh, thermal uh, uh, approach for lithium uh, recovery uh, is really um, interesting. And re right now we, we can see that uh, companies in, uh, in South Korea, even in China, they are actually uh, going for that as well because it has been hydrometallurgical approaches and that has been dominating for lithium ion battery recycling. By this, I think uh, I uh, I thank you all uh, for for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me afterwards. Thank you. Uh, since two projects are missing, I would like to invite Linka. 
uh, to present batteries, Batearis project now. Is it possible, Linka? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. You can just stop sharing your slide. Yeah, I, I'll try to, to find it. Uh, uh, how can I do it? Mm. Yeah. It's okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Did you full screen now? Yes. Okay. So um I will present to you um the battery iris project which was financed via the Aramin 2 um network. It objective was a little bit different because we were not doing uh, recycling of lithium-ion batteries but nickel metal hydride batteries uh, and the objective was to achieve rare earth selective separation from the spent nickel metal hydride batteries and the project was coordinated um, by myself and my colleague Nicola Papaikonomu who is also present here today. Um, we've been uh, quite a small research consortium with three academic laboratories from Portugal and France and a French industry partner and we have worked together on this project. Um, the total budget of the project exceeded 1 million euros while the funded amount was uh, nearly 700,000 euros and more than 10 researchers have um, worked together on this project to achieve a complete flow sheet for the full recovery of metals from used spent uh, nickel metal hydride batteries. And also um, we've assessed the environmental impacts of, uh, of, uh, of the project. Um, we've published one patent, 10 um, articles, and uh, we've created four temporary research jobs. And um, the final slide presents you the flow sheet starting with the batteries crashing. So um, over here, so uh, the batteries are at first crushed and grinded. Then there's a leaching step. Um, followed by a selective um, separation of rare earths that was achieved using a selective oxidative precipitation uh, and a reduced solution, and an ionic liquid based separation um, and precipitation. Then on the other side of the flow sheet, you can see the transition metal separation. So these transition metals have been uh, recovered using our patent based acidic aqueous biphasic systems, uh, also based on the ionic liquids, uh, leading to selective separation of nickel and cobalt that have been recovered by electrodeposition with very high purities. Um, so this is in brief, uh, the battery iris project, uh, it was namely a very academic based project with a lot of um, I would say base research. So we started with very low TRL, somewhere around zero or one, and we've uh, went up to, let's say three, maybe four. Um, so the project ended uh, like six years ago. So um, if you have some um, some questions, I'm here also to, and my colleague is also here to reply uh, them all. So thank you for your attention. Thank As you. we have only two projects, uh, Dorothea, <laughs> why yeah. why don't we why don't we join the other four? Yeah, I invite also Baclan project. Stoyan will have a presentation in this group, and maybe then we can have discussion, not to have too much at once. Okay, okay, good. Good afternoon, everybody. I would just like to 
applaud my presentation, please. Yeah. Have a bit patient. Share. Could you see it now? Yeah, we can see it. We okay. can start. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the initiative. It's a very lovely discussion among uh, different experts. I'm really pleased to be there. So I will present this project, which stands for Bioassisted Closed Loop Recycling of Immobility Metals from Waste PCBs and Lithium-Ion Batteries. Since today we are more focused on the Lithium-Ion Batteries, of course, I will skip the part on the printed circuit boards. So I'm presenting on behalf of the coordination team, which is coming from Turkey. It is the Suleyman Demirel University and the industrial partner also from Turkey, which has supplied all the stuff, all the materials. Exitcom, then we have uh, myself from ETH University in the Wallonian side of Belgium. And then we have a company, Singolon, which has been charged with microbiological uh, backup and uh, analysis. And we have a partner from France, namely the Institut Paris Group, um, the Globe de Paris. Institute of Physique de Globe de Paris, which is a, a, a research institute uh, specializing on recovery of metals from liquid systems. And the project is almost ended uh, since we have uh, some um, trans some extension with four months until February this year, but actually it has ended 10th of uh, November last year and it has been submitted to ERMI2. Uh, and funded to this uh, call in 2021. <clears throat> so here it comes on actually to to speak about uh, hydrometallurgical recycling of uh, black mass coming from shredded batteries supplied from the exit comp partner, which is the biggest recycle, recycling actor in Turkey. So they have supplied a representative batch of their lithium-ion batteries uh, from their stocks. And the approach is a bit exotic to use bacteria, to use microorganisms, which are able to generate uh, lixiviant to selectively munch out the metals from this black mass. So our approach was like this. First, we generate the biolixiviant in um, uh, classical biofermenter under strict conditions and uh, respective nutrient media. And this, uh, the, we have investigated different uh, microbiological consortia. Now I will focus only on the acidophilic microorganism, but we used to have heterotrophs as well. So I will give you just a flavor of what we have done. And then the black mass is transferred to the reactor, continuous steel tank reactor. Uh, when the bleaching is taking place, uh, thanks to the active uh, bacterial substrate. And then the PLS, pregnant bleach solution, classically goes downstream. But here we have again microbial approach through uh, urolytic, urolytic bacteria. This was the task of our French part from Paris, where the objective was to eventually recover the nickel, cobalt, um, and manganese as carbonates which could be used for further uh, battery precursors. So in, to close entirely the loop. So the challenge is enormous because the batteries actually are quite uh, heterogeneous. You know, they, they are different cathodic chem chemistry, cathodic material chemistry. At least we have found here four different chem chemistries, LCOs, NMCs, uh, LMO and NMC. And uh, there is a challenge to make appropriate liberation of the material in order for the surfaces to be exposed. So one of the deliverables from this project is definitely a nice uh, methodological tool for uh, observation of uh, chemistry under uh, automatic mineralogy system, which we have here in the edge. So once this is done, of course, the batteries are shredded. Then we used to have a physical separation through screening and the uh, fraction which has been below 500 microns so went to the leaching through the bacterial solution. And the leaching actually was, again, quite a challenge because of a lot of toxicants 
which needs to be removed in advance in order for the bacterial consortium to survive. But on the other side, we used to have a very experienced partner, and we still have them on board, which is the company Singolon, uh, which uh, has been tasked to develop a methodology for modifying the bacteria in order for these bacteria to become very robust and very um, efficient in order not to be harmed by the toxicants. And we have found especially the organic material and the organic materials, namely the electrolyte, which has been, um, which has acting like, um, uh, like a uh, stop for the growth of the bacteria. It, it has hindered their bacterial growth. That's why here the approach was to modify the gen the gene in the bacteria to implement some uh, genes which are resisting to metals and uh, therefore the bacteria won't be killed, won't be inhibited through the um, toxic, ac uh, toxic action of the both organic material and the heavy metals. So there is a protocol which we have developed, the so-called toolbox, which is now ready to be exploited, not only in the bio leaching of uh, uh, batteries, but also in the bio leaching of uh, raw materials. And uh, just to finalize uh, some of the results uh, and some of the take home messages, which have uh, been developed through this project. Uh, so like I told you, that we have uh, been able to detect which compounds in the batteries exactly are no, notorious and toxic to microbial uh, flora in the leaching. And then we have tried several approaches, including thermal treatment and roasting to render the nickel, cobalt, and manganese entirely leachable because the chemistry, you know, in this uh, chem, uh, formulation, cobalt, for example, is present in both forms as cobalt-2 and cobalt-3. So there is a need to reduce the cobalt three to cobalt two in order to be leachable. The same is for the, with the nickel. So one stoichiometry is definitely needed, and uh, we have uh, developed such kind of uh, methodological tool. The second toolbox is uh, for the genetically improving the employed acidophilic strains. This is just starting, but we hope. This is, uh, has a very large implication, not only in this case, uh, the way to uh, implant metal resistive genes to uh, classical acidophilic organisms. And then for the um, downstream treatment, we have proved the concept that some uh, organisms could bound the metals which are dissolved in the PLS and then transform them to carbonates simply by precipitation. And here on the on the figure, you, you see actually the level of leaching, which we have achieved at 4% pulp density, which for hydrometallurgy is not uh, exactly the objective because uh, for higher TRL level, we have to target at least 10% pulp density, but at least we are happy now with 4% because of this highly heterogeneous uh, composition of the black mass. And you see in, in 72 hours, we have about 70% more or less, 78% uh, aluminum copper is entirely leached out and uh, cobalt is about 64%. And then we have, we used to have a partner which is quite a uh, specialist with the uh, design of this uh, entire simulation of the entire process. And so we have developed the conceptual flow sheet uh, for unit operation connection with the mass balance of the solid and the liquid in view of eventual scale up of the process uh, at pilot scale. So we know what uh, you need where to put and how to loop these streams of both the solid and the liquid. So we are ready for some upscaling, but of course some additional work is needed to, to prove the, to, conceptualize entirely this uh, leaching step and especially on the carbonite uh, precipitation, we still have uh, some uh, aspects to optimize further. So if you have any 
questions, don't hesitate to ask or to, to give a shout on that topic. I will be happy to answer on behalf of the consortium. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I will stop sharing for just a second. So Marcela is just that we now have a short discussion on those three projects next leap batteries and backlap yeah uh, thank you uh, coming back to trl levels uh, like we did in the previous session i believe that we are here with three projects at low trl uh, as well for next lip, for battery Ares, and for Baclem. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for the battery Ares, um, the project was very, very fundamental. So we started very low, somewhere where it's close to zero, and we went up to, let's say, TRL three or maybe four, but not higher. Yeah, regarding backlink, yeah, I agree. For some work packages, we are more maybe on TRL 2 or 3, uh, while other are on 4, but uh, yeah, so it depends on which process uh, you're, we're speaking about. You know, the, the bioreaching is known as a technology, but still on e-waste mm -hmm. or especially on batteries, still on, on its um, yeah. embryonal stage. And for next slip, yeah, I think for um, we will not say it's a pilot. Uh, I think our TRI is like uh, about four to six. Uh, but as I say, uh, parts of this uh, project we have now in another project lithium, uh, uh, high temperature recovery of lithium. Uh, large parts we have in the Swedish project. We have now up to uh, really, really big scale. I will, I will say it's eight to nine uh, TRL. And we, we can manage it as well uh, using a very big scale. And uh, we are in that project, we're running like one ton per hour. So it's quite, quite fast. And that's, that's the, uh, I think, uh, if you're comparing uh, hydro and, and, and a pure metallurgical process, and um, and that's the, the 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 big difference is like um, because of the e because the the step is quite simple you have one step and you are separated lithium uh, from cobalt and nickel and you get the nickel and cobalt metal uh, alloys uh, directly and uh, and then you can get the very high heat of everything for for your project of next lip um, I see that you are quite successful in the lithium recovery. Yeah. 96% if I heard well. Yes. Uh, you're doing well with the graphite as well. But uh, uh, graphite not as, as high as, yeah, as 68%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'm a little bit puzzled um, with what we are doing on uh, the black mass. So you are treating the black mass by hydrometallurgy um, and you recover there, I've seen 100% of all the different metals. Uh, at what scale is this? Is this at lab scale? Did you pilot that? Uh, <laughs> and can you please explain a little bit more about the technologies that you are using there? Uh, uh, I'm uh, Okay, I'm the coordinator of the project, but I'm not expert on hydrometallurgical parts. And I'm not sure if our partners on hydrometallurgy is here in this uh, this um, meeting, uh, but I'm I don't think uh, I think it's like uh, if they are in the process when they are looking at each metal and they can they can have like up to one hundred, so it's not really one hundred. Uh, so so for. So, so if you again, uh, that's the things we have to think about hydrometallurgic processes because your lithium, you have uh, among uh, cobalt, you have all these elements, and for each step, you will lose something. 
So normally the first uh, end months you recover, you get very high yield, and the next one you will lose more and more. So the last one, end months you are recover, you will be quite low actually. So so uh, so um. Uh, I don't think uh, the the one hundred person showing in the uh, in the uh, PowerPoint uh, is is really uh, seeing the for the whole process. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the case. Yeah, um, but hydrometallurgical processes are established, exist already. Yeah, what did you? Uh, Specially invent in the pro in the project for hydrometallurgical treatment. What makes you different from industrial processes that exist? Well, I, I again, I'm not a specialist in hydrometallurgy, uh, and 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 our partners uh, for that they are probably not here. Uh, I think uh, when we start the project and. Uh, Oh, our partners they identify that okay the existing uh, processes they have always some uh, difficulties some uh, challenges and they try to uh, you know um, solve that kinds of problem and uh, again I'm not here to judge if they have a success in that or not and uh, I agree totally with you that there are so many recipes for hydrometallic approaches. So it's it's really, uh, it might be interesting uh, to, to have kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, comparison because even we are working with uh, companies like uh, Northwell, for example, in Sweden, and they have their own uh, recipe. So <laughs> you don't know uh, actually what's, uh, uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I think most people are working uh, very much on uh, on impurity things, uh, like you have iron, you have aluminum, and how they affect uh, precipitation and uh, and so on. Thank you uh, for the nickel metal hydride um, ionic liquids. Um, ionic li liquids have already been studied in lithium ion batteries as well as uh, lithium. Um, but they ha they haven't been very successful yet. Um, and that for several reasons, because of their stability, recyclability, uh, because of their selectivity, uh, because of the cost, etc. Why uh, did you choose here specifically for ionic liquids? Um, Lenka, maybe I can answer. Thank you. Go on. Hello. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, indeed, actually, this is this was of course one kind of drawback that we could find that posteriori afterwards. Uh, remember that the project started in 2016, so nearly eight years later, we where now we have much more background that we had before for uh, such application. The, the initial objective was really to, to try to develop new hydrometallurgical systems based on more sustainable solvents. So we can argue a long time about what is sustainable, what is not. Yeah. Uh, it was our strategy to uh, work on such technology. Um, note also that the ionic liquid that we're using were non-perfluorinated solvents. We're trying to avoid uh, this compound that significantly increase the toxicity, but also the price. Uh, it's true that we have not carried out some economical uh, assessment to see whether it was really useful or not. Now, uh, on a more fundamental level, it's true that we had good results for nickel, cobalt, which already was a kind of a, a little breakthrough on that field. Also, um, well, we, we don't have the time now, but uh, the flow sheet has also introduced some simple uh, systems not based on um, ionic liquids, just in order to separate manganese from other iron and, and, and cobalt and nickel systems based on ozonation. So we were starting, we were really starting to work on, on systems much more sustainable, um, either sim simple or stable. Voila. Yeah. This is a, that's and of course there are limitations due to ionic liquids. That's true. Thank you. That's very clear. And then to Stoyan for uh, the 
by assisted leaching and recycling. Uh, this is a very nice process, but what is the uh, pros and the cons of the system? Uh, the con <clears throat> is probably uh, the slow leaching. Do you agree with that? Yeah, the, the kinetics is, uh, it depends on the solid density. If you are working at, at low solid density, up to 3%, if you are happy with 24 to 48 hours, you could get something about 80% of the metals inside the solution. Then the other, the other challenge is the iron, which is uh, has to be pushed out because you have always generation of gyrosite. Thanks to this uh, nutrient media, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to convince uh, industrial actor to embrace this technology, especially for uh, battery, end of life batteries and the black mass uh, coming out from that. If the black mass, however, is not uh, containing any electrolyte or any um, binder with what we know is a, a production scrap we have proved that the bacteria are very happy with such kind of materials. Yeah. The, the Actually, the hurdle is those organics because they really are impeding the growth of the bacteria. And uh, if we have a nice consortium, which we already have, which is resistant to nickel, cobalt, and uh, uh, copper, then the, there is no any problem to rise the solid density uh, about uh, ten percent, and the time frame, the duration could be reasonable in seventy-two hours to bring all the metals. I think it's it's reasonable, it's tangible. Thank and you. here, here we have tried one one microbe which is uh, discovered from long time ago by Ubicor, and it has metal metal resistance. Uh, uh, also faculties and we have tried exactly to implant this gen to our bacteria, the original gen from this uh, from this microbiome. Very, very good and very clear. Thank you. Time maybe to shift to the next group. To yes, I'm inviting Eliminate Project uh, Ersin to, to give a presentation since the time is quite short. Ersin, are you here? Hi, it's Christy yes. Dorfman Hi, uh, again, sorry. Sorry, Christy. We can see um, you. Please continue. All right, thank you very much. I'm Christy Dorfman from Stellenbosch University. I'm coordinator for the project Eliminate uh, for end-of-life lithium battery management integration and technology evaluation. Um, and this is a, a project that took a, a multiple prong approach to the issue of establishing lithium ion battery recycling facilities in South Africa and in Europe. And therefore the objectives were rather diverse um, and summarized here. So you can see that we considered a number of different biometallurgical process routes, some of them based on existing or conventional technologies and some of them novel technologies developed as part of the project. Um, and what we essentially then did is to compare these processes from environmental impact perspective. So that was the one objective. The second objective was to perform market analysis, uh, business development to see how these different processes could potentially integrate in the existing value chains in South Africa and in the European context. Uh, we looked at material flow analysis and reverse logistics optimization. And then, as I said, we also had development of new alternative hydrometallurgical battery recycling processes. Mm -hmm. uh, the consortium consisted of five partners, uh, Stellenbosch University, South Africa as the coordinator, IDL Swedish Environmental Research Institute, Karolinus Technical University, Chalmers University of Technology, and Exitcom Recycling as an industry partner on the project. Uh, just going to give you a very brief snapshot of, of some of the key findings and results from the different objectives. Uh, so the first work package or objective looked at um, how the market to react and how we can possibly integrate um, our different processes within the existing value chains. And we took a classical approach of looking at economic considerations, technological considerations, policies, regulations, social environmental impact and business strategy. 
and essentially saying if we want to enter the market, there should be a focus on cost leadership as is typical for, for commodities. The second work package or the second object the focus on comparing the different hydrometallurgical processes from an environmental impact perspective. And here we use specifically a life cycle assessment methodology. The results that I show here are for the conventional technology. So hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, citric acid, using a range of different potential products. So NMC refers to a mixed nickel manganese cobalt oxide product. Sequential precipitation refers to recovery of metals as individual products, and uh, SX refers to using solvent extraction-based processes to recover the individual metals. We also subsequently did some work on the novel hydrometallurgical processes to compare those impacts with these conventional methods as well. But what we can see here, for example, is that typically your mixed NMC product um, production is the process that uh, is most environmentally friendly followed by sequential precipitation typically, and finally this solvent extraction based processes. And what we've also seen is that uh, sulfuric acid based processes is generally more environmentally friendly than hydrochloric acid and more environmentally friendly than citric acid, organic acid, which I think is, is contrary to popular belief. And there are various reasons for that. These results were also subsequently used for things like weak point analysis to identify the areas where we can improve our processes based on environmental impact. And we also looked at sensitivity analysis and so forth so from an environmental impact perspective. So that was our second uh, work package. The third work package looked at uh, material flow analysis, both in South African and in the European context. Uh, for the presentation today, I'm just giving you a snapshot of, of results from the South African study. And essentially what we did is looking at the flow of material and then looking at different uh, reverse logistic network models um, for the different processing options. So hydrochloric acid, where we produce single products, hydrochloric acid, where we produce mixed product, citric acid and citric acid uh, mixed product. And then looking at, uh, for example, where should our uh, collection sites be located? What should the reverse logistics network look like? Should we have a single facility? Should we have multiple facilities? And for those different reverse logistic network, we can then calculate net present value. Um, and the finding that eventually transpires for the South African context is if we are looking at reverse logistics network, then typically we would have quite a large distribution of collection centers, 212 collection centers in total with nine dismantling facilities. And they are indicated by these blue nodes and one lithium ion battery processing facility. And this was then the network that gave us the best uh, net present value also based on things like uh, carbon uh, tax from a transport perspective and so forth. So that was the third objective. And then the fourth objective uh, focused on uh, development of novel hydrometallurgical processes. And uh, my colleague, uh, Prof. Erzen from KTU is also in the meeting. He was primarily responsible for this activity in collaboration with Exitcom. So some of the novel processes that they looked at was uh, solvent displacement crystallization and use of um, methanosulfonic acid in metal recovery from lithium ion batteries. And uh, the results at the end were evaluated at pilot scale in collaboration with Exitcom and uh, just showing you a couple of the photos from that operation. So is project partner, uh, Prof. Erzen, who's in the meeting and can provide uh, perhaps more details if required. And then uh, just as an illustration of the typical products that were produced um, with these novel processes that they developed at, at KTU, cobalt hydroxide, uh, sulfates, manganese oxide, graphite, and, and black mass. Um, so from a TRL level perspective, this probably sits at about a five or six, uh, considering the piloting that have been done um, with the industry partner, Exitcom, um, in collaboration with, with KTU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nan. Thank you, Christy. Now I would like to ask Nant to uh, present Acrobat project. All right, thank you. Can everybody see it? We can see it. It's not in presentation mode yet, but we can see it. Ah, now it is. It is. Can you also see the pointer? Uh, it's a, you have two screens, so it's a little bit difficult to see, <clears throat> but uh, you, you, you just continue, we can, we can read. All right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, it's because my laptop is connected with my desktop. Maybe I can, yeah, no, because my connection will fall out. And if I do it, is it clear? 
Yeah, we can see just. Uh, uh, okay, okay. So, uh, my name is Nand Peters. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Sim Square, uh, which is like a research center of the KU Leuven, which is a Belgian university. And I will be speaking on behalf of Jeroen Sporen, which is the project uh, coordinator of the Acrobat project. And he works at FITO, which is also a, uni uh, a research facility uh, of Flanders. Uh, the Acrobat project is a part of the Eramin 3 call. Um, it's a two-year project it started in August uh, last year and will also end in August this year. And it's about the recycling of critical raw materials from spent lithium-ion batteries. But here we focus on lithium iron phosphate, so LFP. Uh, as cathode material, as it is a Chinese more cheaper alternative for, for example, NMC cathode types that you already saw uh, in the nice meetings that already were given. In a nutshell, uh, the green box here, I'm going to go fast through it. So the Acrobat process starts with the collection of LFP cells. They are discharged, dismantled. Then you have the pretreatment to produce LFP black mass. But during the pretreatment, there is an attempt made to also recover the electrolyte material. Once you have the LFP black mass, there is um, a continuous inline quality control. Um, after that, there is an attempt made to recover the graphite and also then to use the recovered graphite uh, for direct recycling to produce new battery material. Once the graphite is out of the black mass, um, then there is also an hydro hydrometallurgical uh, ACL beach recovery route to recover lithium and all the other precious metals. In the next slide, you can see that we have six main objectives. Uh, the first one is the dismantling and the pay treatment, which is done by Acrodec, um, which is a German um, battery recycling industrial company. The second um, objective is done by Enea. It's an Italian uh, research in an innovation center, and they were concerning the extractive recovery of the electrolytes from the um, LFP cells. And then in the third ob objective, there is then the Fraunhofer um, Institution for Laser Technology as third partner, and they were responsible for the inline characterization of the black mass. In the fourth objective, there is SimSquare, us, and FITO for the recovery of graphite from the LFP. Then the fifth objective is regarding the recycling of the graphite and spent LFP cathode material into version LFP material, which is done by Vito. And we are in the last part also, which is the hydrometallurgical uh, recovery route to get lithium from the LFP black mass and also to convert it into battery grade lithium hydroxide monohydrate, as it is now recently more used or increasingly used compared to lithium carbonate. The main um, results uh, first for the dismantling at the pretreatment, Acurec uh, shows has developed some different pretreatment methods. And here in the middle, you can see that they can reduce the cross contamination of the black mass, or they call it the activated material, the AM, into the foils and vice versa to a low uh, to a low level below five percentage. Regarding the second objective, Enea has already um, developed some analytical methods that can characterize the electrolyte and is also able to selectively extract it over the rest uh, using solvent extraction. Regarding the third objective, uh, Fraunhofer has used a special technique called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. And here they shoot laser beams at the black mass. And then they have a sort of like first insight with the content of the black mass is, which is very interesting. Regarding objective four, Vito and us uh, can now recover more than 80% of the graphite from the LFP black mass using flux rotation. And we also saw then after the graphite is removed, the spent LFP, a part of it here, the LFP is converted into, I think it's called iron pyrophosphate. And in the fifth objective, Vito has been able to convert the iron pyrophosphate again into LFP for uh, to use that into version LFP. And in the last objective, we at Kai Leuven were 
able to recover 90, 90% of the leech and by just leaching the LFP black mass with HEL, we can then separate it from uh, the lithium from the iron, aluminum, and copper with um, solvent extraction or just precipitation. Then we have then battery grade lithium, and then we can convert it the lithium chloride into lithium hydroxide by using a new method in based on solvent extraction instead of precipitation, and we could convert 96.6 percentage. Um, regarding the TRL, the last part here is done at the 75 liter scale. And the objective four and five are at five kilogram scale. And the rest is more or less between TRL four and five of the other objectives. If you have more questions about the project, uh, you can always visit the website, contact me or contact the project uh, coordinator, which is Jeroen Spohr. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we have a Resilip project uh, presented by Michael Hoffman. Michael. Okay, we can see the presentation. So, perfect. So, good afternoon, and, everyone. Yeah. My name is Michael Hofmann, and I'm working at the Fraunhofer ISC in Germany. And I have the chance today to give you some insights into the Resile project, which is an acronym for direct recycling of lithium ion batteries. And Resile was funded under the ERM and Joint Call 2021. And it started in May 2022. So that means we are now approximately at half time of the project. So the Resilab Consortium consists of six partners from three different countries. So the Fraunhofer ISC from Germany is the coordinator. Then we have with us the Ghent University from Belgium, Hutchinson from France, and recycling company from Germany, Impulstech. And additionally, we have two associated partners from Germany, SEPA and the Bavarian Research Alliance. The main objective of Resilab can be summarized as the following. We want to establish a sustainable, low energy, high performance and highly efficient manufacturing and recycling chain for lithium mine batteries. So how do we want to do this? What are the exact activities of Resilab that I want to show you with that scheme here? So at the beginning of the project, we started with fresh battery materials like lithium iron phosphate, LFP, and lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide, NCM. And with that fresh materials, we fabricated in the first step electrodes via a novel solventless melt process, which eliminates the use of the reproductive toxic solvent NMP, and is also a PFAS-free process for electrode manufacturing. Afterwards, we assembled pouch cells and did electrochemical testing with the electrodes. That has two reasons. One is that we have a reference. So that means electrochemical performance of cells containing only fresh material. And the other one is that we then have H cells, which we will use to test our recycling route. And in the Recycle project, we focus on the so-called direct recycling approach, which has the aim to conserve all the better materials in their original structure. So let's say we do not cycle them down to metal salts, but rather we want to recover LFP and NCM in their structure. And this recycling chain in Recycle starts with cell dismantling and component separation via electrohydraulic fragmentation which gives amongst others the so-called black mass, which is then ideally a mixture mainly consisting of active material, carbon, black, and binders. And in a subsequent separation step by a centrifuge process, we further separate this black mass then. And this is possible when you have different particle sizes and different particle densities. Uh, when we then have a relatively pure fraction of active material, we perform a regeneration step and here the aim is that we repair the structure of aged cathode materials to have a cathode material with properties relatively similar to fresh material. As soon as we are at this point, our recycled circle starts again. So that means we reintegrate the recycled material into electrode fabrication, cell manufacturing and perform electrochemical testing. And here our aim for the project is that at the end that we demonstrate that we can use up to 25% of recycled electrode material without having detrimental effects on the cell performance. Um, all of our activities are framed by a sustainability assessment, which includes amongst others, life cycle assessment and social hotspot analysis. 
And of course, we have also dissemination and networking activities ongoing for our project. Uh, to summarize, what is the mid to long term expected impact of our Resilent project? It is that we want to provide an alternative, eco friendly cutter production route to minimize the use of N methyl 2 pyrolidone and polyvinylidene fluoride. We want to demonstrate the recovery of electrode materials with a high yield using low energy processes thus strengthening the raw materials circular economy in the European battery industry and reduce the dependency of battery materials manufacturers on foreign critical raw materials. So this was a rather short presentation. I want to thank you for your attention. If you want to have more details to our Resilient project, please visit our website. And I want to thank all our funding agencies and I also want to uh, raise your attention on this here. So at Fraunhofer ISSC, we are organizing a direct recycling battery conference in October. So it would be great if some of us, uh, some of you will join this conference here. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm uh, asking if there is someone who could present lights project. Seems that Alexandre is, all, is um, have a problem with connection again. But Otherwise... we are now here. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, in fact, it will be uh, Joanna that will present. So, uh, give okay. her the floor. Okay. Just let me share the screen. Okay. Let we can see it is not this, uh, full screen. Are you able to see full screen now? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So uh, we are here. Uh, the University of Porto is uh, presenting the Airmin to Lights project um, on behalf of the coordinator, which was the University of Lorraine. And uh, the Lights project run uh, from 2018 to uh, 2021. And light stands for lightweight integrated ground and airborne hyperspectral topological solution. So this is the was the main workflow of um, of the project. It involved industrial partners, um, namely BIC, um, the German Research Center for Geosciences, and uh, three universities: the University of Porto, the University of Claude Bernard Lyon, and the University of Lorraine. And as you can see, um, the LIGHTS project aimed to integrate um, data acquired at several scales, namely at satellite, drone-borne uh, drone um, measurements, and combine them with field validation and also with the geological modeling to uh, develop software for real-time data interpretation. So uh, our study area was the Frigineda almendra pegmatite field, which is located in uh, central Iberia and which spreads from uh, Portugal to Spain. And we focused on uh, lithium bearing pegmatites, specifically on um, petalite bearing pegmatites. And uh, um, most of our studies uh, were conducted in the Bajoca open pit mine. So, um, we, uh, based on uh, data that we acquired in the field and also historical uh, drill hole uh, data, we were able to um, perform 3D modeling of this uh, Bajoka uh, deposit. Uh, and we, as you can see, we were able to uh, model how the pegmatite dike uh, was uh, behaving um, at depth. And we were able also to model smaller pegmatite bodies that uh, were not outcropping at the time. We also acquired uh, spectral um, information, either in the outcrops using these uh, equipments that are spectral radiometers, but also at the distance, either with the UAVs and sensors mounted on the UAVs, and also using um, Copernicus satellite data. So um, by acquiring the data at, this, with the, at these different stages, we were able to uh, cover different steps of mineral exploration. So the satellite images were mainly used at the district scale, 
while at an intermediate scale, we use the UAV or drone borne hyperspectral surveys. And then at the target or mineral grain scale, we use the handheld spectroscopy. So this is just um, a very quick slide to explain the role of this reflectance spectra uh, and the portable equipment that we use in the field or the sensors that can be on boards of the satellites or drones, they will measure the electromagnetic energy that is reflected uh, coming from the sun and that is reflected at the surface and each mineral or rock can have um, specific or diagnostic um, spectra that we used um, in, in this uh, project. So based on this information, we applied several image processing techniques uh, in the Fresnel Almendra field. And you can see that we were able to detect um, the three uh, the pegmatites in the three open pit mines of our study area. This is uh, with a technique called RGB combinations. We can see similar results using the band ratios technique. And lastly, we also employed um, in, in artificial intelligence, namely machine learning algorithms such as support vector machine. Uh, and we were able to correctly identify the pegmatides, the lithium pegmatides within um, the open pit mines. Uh, we also uh, performed uh, LIPS um, studies. So we created a database of leap spectra for different lithium minerals. And in the frame of lights, we also performed the calibration of a portable um, SIAPS uh, LIBS equipment. And lastly, uh, using uh, artificial intelligence, we were able to combine and integrate all the data. So all the remote sensing data, the um, 3D modeling, the geochemical data available for the region. Um, and um, we combined all this data using artificial intelligence to um, develop uh, what we call a mineral prospectivity mapping, which indicates the most favorable regions for uh, lithium uh, potential. So this is also a result of the technology that was um, uh, developed in lights. Here we have um, a camera that can be either mounted on a, a fixed tripod or in a UAV that uh, can, uh, um, in a quick way, um, scan, the, in this case, the mine face and classify uh, the pegmatites and the um, uh, and the host rocks, and also to subdivide the pegmatite in according to the, um, the minerals in each zone. So the results in the uh, lights paved the way for uh, new projects, and um, uh, we we are currently working on the Age 2020 Green Peg project, which focus on uh, pegmatite um, exploration at different scales and where we are applying distinct tools um, to have a complete overview of uh, how we can improve uh, the discovery of pegmatites, including uh, lithium-bearing pegmatites. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> I assume that we will have a short discussion now. Thank you. <laughs> It will be short because we are running out of time nearly. Uh, on the recycling program <clears throat> uh, project, um, yeah, we had two projects on direct recycling. I invite you please to look at Battery 2030 Plus Recyclability Program in the roadmap where we develop uh, projects and procedures for direct recycling. And um, personally, I will do in the Direct Recycling Symposium in Würzburg a keynote presentation on Battery 2030 Plus uh, Direct Recycling Initiatives. Now, <clears throat> uh, for Nant uh, and Acrobat, in fact, what you are doing is recovering um, an iron phosphate uh, product but that is not purely 100% direct recycling, but because it still needs to be reliciated. Am I, am I correct with that? Direct, uh, recycling, yes, yes, direct yes. recycling is in fact a, a recovery of the full product, reliciated product, 
uh, restore the crystallographic structure of the product, etc. But you recover an iron phosphate. That mm -hmm. is not a final product. It still needs to be relitiated. Yeah, of course, it can be. Uh, this is it's a pity that Jeroen's born is not here because it's from Vito and his task. But uh, as far as I can, I'm can remember on that part is indeed it does it cannot be directly be reused. So maybe the term is not the correct term indeed. Thank you. Uh, very nice presentation by Lights, and I wish you a lot of success in the Horizon 2020 initiatives and projects. Um, on Eliminate, <clears throat> it's all about novel hydrometallurgical processes, but they have not been specified. Can you shortly introduce a little bit of those um, novel processes? In eliminate. Uh, to my uh, novel is investigated uh, was the uh, solvent displacement crystallization and use of um, um, uh, sulfonic acid. Um, I don't know if my colleague uh, Fashion is still online. He was responsible for that um, work package. If you want to add to that discussion, please, Alan, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Risile. Uh, Risi, Risa Lip, uh, Michael, um, it's all about purity in the recovery of the um, lithium iron phosphate. Where are you with the purity? Is the purity okay? Sufficiently okay for reuse? So at the moment, yeah, we are at half time of the project and would say there's still a couple of things we have to do for post purification because as you mentioned, um, for example, there are also some fragments of current collectors in the black mass, and here we have to see how we can eliminate this to get a relatively pure LFP. Uh, I also want to shortly comment on the question for Akovat. I also have to mention that for us, the LFP is not completely lithiated. So there's one degradation mechanism in the cell, which is, for example, lithium loss, which you cannot avoid in aged materials. So we have an aged LFP with, let's say, maybe like 80% of lithium still in it. So we also need to really create the, re uh, the remaining 20%. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Okay, and uh, Dorita, Dorothea, shall I conclude? Yes, please. But we are faced with um, a huge recycling um, challenge uh, in Europe and in the world. There is about uh, 200,000 tons of recycling capacity installed in the world, and that's mainly in China. Um, China is probably expected to retain this dominant position because they are doing large amounts of additional capacity installments. Looking at the market by 2000 and 2040, one expects, one expects roughly 1,300 gigawatt hours uh, to be recycled. Batteries that come to end of life. That is roughly 6,000 kiloton of per year of uh, battery material that needs to be recycled. So you see huge investments needed in um, research and development for improved processes and uh, huge um, additional capacity recycling uh, to be installed. And that's what we discussed a little bit uh, today. Uh, Eramin contributes well to uh, the improvement of uh, recycling technologies in Europe. And that will be necessary in the context of the battery directive, implementing mandatory uh, recycling content in new batteries. Also very important in that context is lithium recovery lithium extraction, lithium exploration, and that's what we heard in uh, several uh, projects. So I think we had a good afternoon. 
Um, we'd like to end this seminar by with my sincere thanks to all the speakers for the keynotes and for the respective projects. Thank you for reporting nice results and um, wishing a lot of success to the projects which are still uh, running at this time. I think I can close here the meeting. Dorothea, do you want to add something? Yeah. I would like to add thanks to you, Marcel, to, to round this, this discussion. And I believe that all the participants really have a lot of new information and that they will be uh, gladly uh, collaborate with uh, Batteries 2040 community uh, in the future uh, better. So thank you for your... Uh, collaboration and for your preparing to uh, be a moderator in our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.